Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Hey, hey, this is Hack the Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining me again today. I am your host, John Naster, but you can call me Johnny. My guest today is a former designer, collector of advisors, and Canadian entrepreneur. In 2003, he was running a four-person design agency. He was using Microsoft Word to create his firm's invoices. Then one day, he accidentally saved over an old invoice, and something in him snapped. He knew there had to be a better way. Over the next two weeks, he coded up a solution for his clients, and eventually turned that side project into what is now FreshBooks. My guest and his team spent the next three and a half years building FreshBooks out of his parents' basement. 14 years later, he has built a team of 250 plus people, and FreshBooks is used by over 10 million users. Now, let's hack. Mike McDermott. I want to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Snappa, the fastest way for entrepreneurs to create graphics for their business. Getting your business up and running is hard, and growing it is another hurdle altogether. It seems like we never have enough time to do all the things that we should be doing in our businesses, the things that matter, the things that will help us and our brand stand out and grow. Creating great Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest images can and will allow your business and message to spread and go viral through and find your true fans and customers. But creating these images to look good and get shared is really, really hard and extremely time consuming. Whether you need a blog post image, a social media post, or even a complete infographic, Snappa makes it faster and easier every step of the way. Just think of how long it took you to create an image for your last blog post. If you use Snappa, you can do it in five simple steps, be done and get back to running your business. Snappa was built to make graphic design easy for entrepreneurs. I've been using it for the last two months now, and the graphics that we've been creating for our blog posts are better than we've ever created for the past two years, and we're doing it in less time. You can check out the work at hacktheentrepreneur.com slash blog. You'll see the artwork there. That's created with Snappa in five simple steps and then shared to our social media straight from within Snappa. If you want to harness the power of the 80-20 rule, go to snappa.io slash hack and make 2017 the year you start looking like the real business that you are. Stop wasting time. Start using Snappa. Go to snappa.io slash hack and get started today. We are back with another episode of Hack the Entrepreneur. And today we have a very, very, very special guest. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, John. Absolutely, absolutely. My pleasure. It's been a long time coming and I'm glad to have you. So let's uh, jump into it, Mike. Mike, as an entrepreneur, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? Always hard to, I don't know, I find it hard to talk about myself. So what is something biggest contributor to my success? Okay. So I think here's what I'll say. I feel like I, I grew up in a family, a very fortunate, uh, that had a pretty strong foundation in terms of value set and these kinds of things. And so I carry forward, I, I believe you need two things in business to be successful and really in life, but business was the, you know, is a pretty clear subset of that. And, and it's uh, shared values and alignment. And so I think something that's helped me be successful is I've got a pretty good people sniffer and I, I won't compromise if I feel like, you know, the values are out of, uh, you know, somebody's not going to be sharing the values of the organization. And we have those pretty well documented at this point. And then uh, I think the other part is I work really hard at making sure everyone's on the same page. And sometimes that takes a bunch of effort, but inevitably it's kind of, you know, it saves time downstream, right? And people feel good about things. So it's, uh, yeah, so those are, I mean, I think that's, I'd put that, you know, they're kind of in the same bucket, but the, I think I think the focus in those areas is 
you know, really fundamental to, you know, sort of our long-term success here at FreshBooks and mine as an entrepreneur. Yeah, I like it. And so you said some interesting things in there because you said there's the two things that are necessary for a successful business, but also life. And then you said how they're kind of intertwined. How intertwined is business to life for you? You know, I would say there's not much separation, <laughs> right? That's not to say that I, you know, I don't have a life outside of business, but, you know, I believe in, you know, we, we really believe in, in culture and, and culture is strategy here. And one of the ways that I think about that is I don't want anyone to come to work here and have to wear a work face, right? You want to be the same person you are outside of work that you are at work. And, you know, I think creating the conditions where that's possible is important and then hiring people who behave in that way. Right. And so I, you know, I think in this day and age where, you know, you have a smartphone and, you know, the world is furiously moving along 24 hours a day, especially in technology, there's just, it's not a lot of opportunity to divorce yourself from, you know, the person you, you are at work. It's, it's just, it's a huge tax. And uh, so much easier if you can sort of, you know, be one in the same, you know, and that may mean that if you're working really hard, you know, sometimes you got to take a half day off so you can be a person and get back on the good foot, right? It's, it's kind of all about balance, but I don't know. I, hopefully that makes sense. I feel I, like it, no, it totally, totally makes sense. And I mean, it probably makes a lot of sense because I've been to your offices and the, the sort of like culture and vibe around it is, is exactly what you said. I mean, there's dogs sleeping. People's dogs are sleeping beside their desk. It's amazing. The culture that you've created from that. And I guess that's sort of an extension of you personally and what you want to see in the world. I guess so. I think I just want to be clear, like, but, you know, my def, I, I don't believe that dogs in the office are our culture, right? I think it's a reflection of sort of a workplace environment and that can inform, you know, and, and, and change culture. But Culture to me is what people do when you're not looking, right? It's like, do they walk past a piece of garbage that's on the floor or do they stop and pick it up? You know, will they introduce themselves to someone they know, don't know in the office yet or, or just kind of avoid them and pretend like the incident didn't happen? Like, those to me are the things that are, are harder to measure and track. And then, you know, are you going to be honest and straightforward with someone or is it going to get all political or whatever? These are, these are things that, you know, when I think about culture, I think more along these, these kinds of lines. Does that make sense? That totally makes sense. No, it does. It does. I just wanted to clarify. The which? Oh, I just I just wanted to clarify because I, I actually believe that culture is something that is, you know, poorly understood by most, to be completely honest. And at the same time, like, you know, we have a belief that culture is strategy, right? So it's actually like core to everything, but it's such a nebulous topic that, you know, that it's that it's hard to put your finger on. And so you know, I, 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 and I believe it really matters because I, you know, you want the best, most talented people to want to show up to work every day, you know, especially Mondays, right? That's the, that's the really tough one generally. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so all these things matter. So you can attract and motivate and, you know, or have the individuals who are the best performers be motivated and, and driven themselves because they, they love being there. Would you say that understanding and analyzing, I guess this, like you said, this difference and distinction or belief that culture is strategy amongst so much of like startup culture. Do you think it's your job as a CEO to sort of analyze those things and then decide where to take the company and in which directions? Oh, you know, I, I'll say it two ways. You know, when we hit, I think it was about 20 or 30 people, like at that point in time, I didn't feel like I was quote unquote in control of the culture. Like it kind of had a life of its own at that point. It wasn't just me anymore. But as we have scaled and hit various, you know, sort of organizational breaking points, like 40, 80, 150, you know, 250, it actually is incumbent on me to, you know, diagnose something that may or may not be happening in our culture and, you know, sort of institute what I call culture hacks. <laughs> to sort of, you know, correct things or, or just set them in a more favorable direction. And so I'll give you a specific example. For years, we had been fighting this number 150. It's where organizations kind of break down. It's called Dunbar's number. There's all this stuff around human beings not being able to kind of socialize in the same ways, you know, over 150 as they were before 150. And literally at that point, you know, like we hired 150th person and you know, the first person in like, I don't know, like 10 years walked past me in the hallway and like didn't look me in the eye. And I was like, 
and I had like met everybody during interviews. It was just weird. Right. And so, you know, at that point in time, we kind of instituted a thing called heads up. Hello, which is this expectation. If you walk by somebody in the hallways, your heads up, you say hello. And we teach people this in their first, you know, I don't know if it's 24 hours, but it's part of the, like our onboarding process in the first week is like, this is the expectation. And so I feel like it is my responsibility if, if that's what matters to kind of keeping this place feel like the world's greatest cocktail party, then, then yes, I got to make sure that we sort of institute those hacks. And it's been very effective and I had to say it once. It's remarkable. And so, I mean, from the growth, it's been, I believe, 13, almost 14 years. The story goes from your parents' basement starting. And as you say, like through 20, 30 people, 75, 100, 200 plus people, do you feel like you have to sort of rebirth yourself as a person, as a, like as an entrepreneur, as a CEO to stay in front of that growth curve? Like what you knew last year, is it still valid to you as a CEO this year? I might go so far as to say, you know, the growth of, of some companies are, you know, inhibited or enabled by the growth of their their CEO. And so, yeah, I very much had to contort and reorganize my side many times over the years to, you know, to try and uh, either stay ahead of or not inhibit our growth. And times has been challenging. I feel like I've had, you know, a series of breakthroughs uh, to get to this point. I mean, going from zero to, I don't know, let's call it 200 people is a very unnatural thing to do for, for most individuals. Right. And to do this, do you do you use coaches? Do you use advisors? I would say all of the above. You know, I was saying I like to collect advisors. I do now. And for the past few years, I've had a coach. You know, I would actually say my the team I built around me has been a big part of, you know, helping me. And, uh, you know, I like to think vice versa as well. But that's, you know, that's part of a good team is they're, you know, they're going to they're going to push you in directions that are constructive for everyone. Nice. I like it. So at the beginning, Mike, you said it's that sort of that shared value and the alignment is, and knowing that and being aware of it and using it as your light. That's like your one thing. Every business expert now talks about that whole 80, 20 rule in business. Do the 20% that gets you the 80% of results. Could you tell me something that you are absolutely like not good at within your business? Oh, there are slightly many, 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 many things. You're just making me think is all. So what am I not good at in a business? I think, I mean, I'll say it like this. I am not the best at basically being a functional leader for any part of our business any longer, right? Like it's kind of outstripped my, you know, what I know is, uh, you know, they say, I've heard this said, at scale, the only role not run by a professional is that of CEO, right? You can kind of get away with it in this role of not being the prof <laughs> the professional because you have the vision and you have the moral authority and you have some of these other things. And I, I, I guess I have those things. And so, you know, I'm not the best, you know, marketer anymore here. I'm not the best, you know, you know, technologist or I'm, there's all these areas where, you know, I may have had some edge kind of in the early days and, you know, subsequently sort of let go of and now try to use and you know, try to help folks understand where we're trying to get to. And then they're much better at getting us there. Nice. So, I mean, that's at the forefront of where you are today. If we went back 13 years to when you started, co-founded FreshBooks with Joe Sawada, I believe, how, how was the awareness of sort of like your weaknesses personally within business? How did that play a part in choosing your co-founder? You know, I, I think uh, a couple of ways. So first of all, I built the first version of FreshBooks and I started working with Joe and I immediately said, well, why don't you take on all the, you know, the more technical aspects because you get a doctor in computer science and, you know, you love that stuff. So, so I think I've always been happy to offload things to people who are more competent than I in that area, right? So it's not about hanging on to that stuff, you know, but, but then back to like choice of co-founder, I think Joe and I kind of found each other. <laughs> You know, you, you don't know when you start these relationships out. Like, I can't say I like evaluated him through the 300 criteria, you know, put him through the machine to deduce whether he would be a great co-founder. I think what I found in Joe was, again, someone with an enormous amount of shared values, just a wonderful human being who continues to be to this day, you know, over 10 years later, you know, still involved with the organization, still very supportive. And we, we've helped each other through the years in a variety of ways. So I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, I don't think it was as formalized a process as, you know, I, I kind of feel like you may have expected. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't actually expecting it to be. I mean, typically these things start pretty scrappy sort of, right? I mean, it's hard to maybe talk about now 13 years later because of what you've become, but there's 
endless people sitting that are listening right now that are sitting down in their parents' basement starting something like FreshBooks. And I think they're wondering if they should bring somebody in and how to vet that person as a co-founder or as an employee. Yeah, I think so in that vein, I think the most important thing is to have passion for what you're doing, right? Because that's going to be the thing that keeps you going, you know, because there's probably no good evidence to suggest you, you should keep going, right? That's you, you got to love what you're doing. And then I just say, surround you with people who like add fuel to that fire. Surround yourself with it. That's like, that's like the most important thing, right? You just want like everyone to be net like additive, you know, just because you're adding more people doesn't mean you're getting worse. Like if you're bringing in people who are additive, who kind of get you fired up and, and challenge and push you in good ways. And Joe and I could never agree on anything. Like, and we would just like have knocked down, drag out disagreement, like argument things. And it wasn't like nasty. They weren't like personal in any way. But like, you know, if it was like, where were we going to put a button in the application? It was like three and a half hours later, there would be no decision, <laughs> right? Was, and so, you know, is that, uh, but that was, that was because we both cared so much, right? So I, I don't know what the point of sharing that thing with you is other than to say, you know, I think uh, Joe's a, a great fit and challenged me in a whole bunch of ways. And, you know, long term, that's a great thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that whole having that argument, those arguments are kind of what's crucial. If you guys both think the same way, then there's no point to having two of you typically is sort of the feeling behind it. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, that's right. Diversity in opinions and points of view is a great thing. And so now as a CEO of 250 plus, 260 plus employees, and as a person still wanting to do things and accomplish things and life entwined, we kind of know the story of how you started FreshBooks itself, scratching your own itch and then turning it into this enormous business. How now with projects, when a project or an idea comes through you for either part of your team to implement or for you to take and run with, what is sort of a process you go through, Mike, to determine today when a project is worth your time, energy, and resources? So I guess the first thing is, you know, at this stage of running a business, and now that I have, you know, a team and, you know, they have teams, you know, my, actually my first order of business is to never be responsible for doing anything. And therefore, you know, ironically, kind of being responsible for everything at the end of the day, that's the CEO's role, but I, I really shouldn't be doing anything anymore, John. So then the question is, well, where do I apply my time and how do I, you know, influence things? And it, it's really, I would say in, in two areas, one is to help people kind of catch the flame on where we're going, right? So that they can take their projects, you know, as far as possible, as fast as possible, because they're really clear on why what they're doing matter and, you know, how it leads us to our collective destination. So that's kind of, uh, you know, I guess the vision. And the other piece would be sometimes fixing things, right? You know, identifying things that I feel are off and maybe not headed in the direction we want them to. And, you know, identifying that it is worth my time as opposed to someone else on the teams and, and rolling up my sleeves there and helping to get them kind of back on track. You know, I think those are the two, I don't know, maybe that's oversimplifying, but those are at this stage, two areas that come to mind. Yeah. And I love that idea of never being responsible to do anything yet kind of being responsible for everything. Then to tie it back to how you so closely use coaches and advisors in your life and in your business, have you sort of turned the tables and actively become coaches or advisors to anyone? Yeah. So one thing I've historically done is go out to dinner with various local entrepreneurs on Wednesday nights and, and sort of help them because I'm really committed to, we're based in Toronto, committed to helping build this ecosystem and strengthen the companies here. And it's been just incredible what I've seen, you know, from starting building this business where there kind of was no community and no ecosystem to the kinds of breakout companies we're building today. So, but that's, that's something I, I've had passion for. And I, I do that inside the building as well. I'll spend time with folks and helping them like you know, scaling a company is hard. It's, it's not just for the CEO who's, you know, been a founder. It's also people who's, you know, we're growing, you know, somebody who's been with us for like three years, they might have started out, you know, with no reports and now have, I don't know, 30 years, you know, or they're a team of 30 that they're managing with like two or three direct, like that can be hard, right? So, so I think there's a lot of internal sort of mentoring and coaching that, you know, work on as well. I, I, I a lot of energy for those kinds of things. I will say, and in the bucket of like, some people are natural at that stuff. That's been a, a learning and continues to be a learning process for me. How do I do that effectively? But I, I'm, feel like I'm slowly getting there on that one. Yeah. I guess it's, it's um, 
learning how to want to talk about yourself more because people love to learn from you, I think, and your experiences, both the good and the bad. Yeah, I think, I mean, and that's the thing where, you know, when I sit down with entrepreneurs and they, they want to get the inspiration, you know, yeah, it, it's a balance. I, I mean, I think that's a great source of inspiration, but you know, what I find more powerful is asking them some dumb questions about themselves. Right. And, and then they are forced to say, oh, geez, like maybe I'm missing something here. And the power is not in the time we'd sit down together. The power is when they go and reflect and wake up the next day and they're like, oh my God, I didn't, I didn't see this thing. And you know, so thank you for pointing me to it. I don't even know what I'm going to do, but I know it's a problem now and I'll, I'll figure it out. And you know what, the folks who respond in that way, like I know they will. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely true. And it's, it's, I, it's cool that you give so much time and energy and resources back to the ecosystem you've come from. So Mike, this has been an absolute blast. I want to just wrap up on one final question for you, if I can. This idea I'm working with calling the entrepreneurial gap which seems to be this gap I think we live in as entrepreneurs, as dreamers, that we never personally see ourselves as successful no matter what we accomplish, because we always set bigger, loftier goals into the future, which I agree we have to do. Yet from the outside, Mike, you look really, 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 truly successful. Yet I'm going to guess that you have big goals in front of you and ambitions. So I would love it, Mike, if you could right now take the time to stop, turn and look behind you, the highs, the lows, the wins and the losses over the past 13, 14 years, and tell me how you feel about the journey up until today. Yeah, my, my patented answer for a question along these lines is if, you know, if I, if I knew what that journey would be like, you know, in advance, I, I never would have started, right? Uh, because it's really hard. And I'm not saying that to pump up my own tires. I'm just saying because when you look back, like it's a struggle, it takes longer, like you're forced to learn lessons that you need to learn on a time frame that's completely uncomfortable. Like there's so many things along the way, but you know, the flip of that is you sit here and it's like, wow, I also feel like I've just spent, you know, a huge chunk of my life in a very rewarding way. You know, the challenge and personal, when people ask me like, why do I love doing what I'm doing? It's, it's challenge and personal growth. Those are, those are the things that, you know, I'm into and, you know, keep you coming, make, keep me coming back every day. So I don't know if that gets at the heart of things, John, but that's that's kind of how I think about, you know, looking back. And I will say that entrepreneurial gap you talk about is actually, uh, you know, certainly a thing for me. You know, I don't sit around and I, I try to, as I've gone along over time, I try to stop and what I call smell the roses every now and again, because we've had, you know, a whole bunch of accomplishments along the way. But yeah, I, I generally am very much fixated on the work left undone. You know, I feel like we've done we've done less today than we're going to do. And that is that's very, you know, clear in my mind's eye. And so it's kind of like, you know, get back to work. What have you done for yourself lately? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's you know, that's life and that's, you know, that's what's exciting, right? There's still so much to do. Yeah. Beautifully said, Mike. Beautifully said. All right, Mike, we've got to talk about your business in passing. Could you now just tell the listener your business, where to find it, and then where they can track you down on the internet. So FreshBooks is a ridiculously easy to use accounting software in the cloud designed for self-employed professionals and their teams. And so what that means is if you get paid for your time and expertise, effectively, if you invoice, you need FreshBooks. You can find us at freshbooks.com or in the, uh, the app store, Google Play. And the last part was where you can track me down. I'm just Mike McDermott on, on Twitter is probably the most uh, you know, active place where I live. And even that is a little less active these days than it could be. But I'm out there lurking. I uh, hope to see you there. Excellent. Excellent. So freshbooks.com and Mike McDermott on Twitter and some other places. What about the book, Breaking the Time Barrier? Can we mention that? That's right. That's an excellent book I read last night. Ah, okay. Thanks, John. Yeah, it's a, so Breaking the Time Barrier is... It's a book about how to price your services. So again, we, we serve people who get paid for their time and expertise, not retail, not restaurants, you know, people who get paid for their, really their, their, their skills and knowledge. You know, if you are one of those people, pricing your services is hard. I used to be one myself. I learned a bunch of things. So we wrote a book called Breaking the Time Barrier. It's about a 45 minute to an hour read. Its intent is to help you think differently about the value you bring to your clients and therefore how to price your services. It's been downloaded over a quarter million times. Yeah, you can check it out for free at, you know, it's just search Breaking the Time Barrier. I think it's breakingthetimebarrier.freshbooks.com. You can get it or, or something along those lines. And yeah, I, I honestly, uh, I think it's probably 
you know, I actually think it's, you know, probably one of the most valuable 45 minutes you could spend if you're uh, working for yourself, even if you're running a product company and thinking about how to price services, I think there's, there's value there. So yeah, I mean, thanks for mentioning it. And uh, yeah, please, please check it out if that sounds interesting to you. I absolutely agree. It's told all in story, like a conversation between two people. So it's so easy to read and sink so deep. So I will link to that in the show notes as well for you. So it's easy for you to find. So once again, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to stop by. Thank you for sharing so openly. And please just keep doing what you do. Cool. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. We've all heard about the 80-20 rule in business, right? You find that 20% that gives you the 80% of results. These are our leverage points. These are the things we can use to grow our businesses in 2017. Snappa was built for us. Entrepreneurs who want to stand out this year, but also want to harness the power of 80-20. Snappa was built to be your 20%. Simple graphic design for entrepreneurs to stand out in their market. Go to snappa.io slash hack. The fastest way for entrepreneurs to create graphics. That was a lot of fun. I've been wanting to have that conversation for a long time, and I'm really, really glad Mike and I had a chance to sit down and talk. And we've now, we've, we've reached the point in, in the show where I, I need to go back. I need to go back through this conversation that I've wanted to have for years, and I need to listen to it as a third party, as you get to listen to it originally. So I went back and I listened and I went back and I listened again. That second time through the conversation, there was something that I had missed, but that was said by Mike that was so very, very clear. It was, it was the one thing. Did you get it? Did you hear it? Let's do it. Let's find the hack. So far as to say, you know, the growth of, of some companies are, you know, inhibited or enabled by the growth of their, their CEO. And so, yeah, I very much had to contort and reorganize my side many times over the years to, you know, to try and uh, either stay ahead of or not inhibit our growth. And times has been challenging. I feel like I've had, you know, a series of breakthroughs uh, to get to this point. I mean, going from zero to, I don't know, let's call it 200 people is a very unnatural thing to do for, for most individuals. And that's the hack. Mike, Mike, Mike. I love this. I, I, I truly love this. Coming from the story of you coming up with this idea, creating it over a span of a few weeks yourself, coding it up, and then moving into your parents' basement for the first few years. And then, like you said, taking it from zero to over 200 people on a team. And the fact of how you have to not just grow as a person and as a CEO, as, as a founder, but as you have to like contort and just, just, to, just to stay up ahead of it and to kind of not get driven over by it and then also to be able to lead it to where it needs to or at least not inhibit its growth at some points of exponential sort of growth. And so this idea of the growth of many companies can be inhibited or enabled by the growth of the CEO. So maybe you out there listening don't want to go to 250 employees. Maybe you don't want to go to 100 employees. That's fine. But this goes back to, I think, whatever level you want to, you see yourself as. If you want five outsourced employees or 20 outsourced employees working for you and you working from home building out your software business or your consulting business, whatever it happens to be, it's detrimental to you to not think of yourself as the person in front leading and needing to grow into that position or ahead of that position, right? Our companies don't expand and then carry us along with them as founders. We have to expand personally ourselves. And that will allow and enable our companies to follow up either alongside or behind us. The growth comes from within first rather than the growth being pushed by your company to force you to necessarily grow. And so I love this idea of the zero to 200 and how it's super unnatural for most human beings to kind of go through, but because it is a very unnatural thing for most individuals, but it's that idea of surrounding yourself with advisors and consultants if you need or mentors and forcing yourself to reinvent yourself and grow in the ways that are necessary to get where you want to go. Mike, thank you so very much. 
All right. Well, that was a lot of fun. I'm glad I waited the years that I waited to talk to Mike because it, it, was, it was more than worth it, I'll say. And it's just very cool company over there. And he's done some cool things. It's cool because he's in Toronto now, the same city as me. And that's kind of a, quite a cool thing, I would say. <laughs> All right. Hackthentrepreneur.com is the site. Head over there. Check out Mike. I'll put links that we talked about in the show notes. You can check it out. Check out his book. I'll get a link to that for you as well. It took me less than an hour to read. And it's, it's a great, it's a great read on, I guess, it's not time management. It's about like, just treating your time differently and sort of elevating the way you position yourself and your brand within your marketplace and taking on sort of a different mindset approach to that. And it's, I, I strongly recommend it. So check it out. I'll link to it over there. And you can also get on the email list while you're there. Yeah, it'd be good. I'm sending out my best work every Sunday. You can get the newsletter and uh, see what I've been up to, see what I've been thinking about. And I'll give you that sort of kick that you might need to get the things done you need to get done in the next week. <laughs> All right. It's been fun. Thank you so very much for stopping by. And please, until next time, Keep hacking the entrepreneur.